basically uh, we want to find out that you know the focus of this talk is going to be what we call degenerative ataxia. So you you see here in this scan other things that can give you ataxia. These the little white dots. This is the cerebellum looking from above. This is the spinal fluid. These white dots are demyelinated plaques. This is multiple sclerosis. You can see ataxia from multiple sclerosis. You can see ataxia, there is a tumor sitting there. All these can be usually very quickly diagnosed by history, by examination, and especially by doing MR scans and other types of imaging studies. But in today's talk, we're gonna talk about this kind of ataxia that I show here where the cerebellum is atrophied, it is shrunken. Normally this should be filling up this black space here. The black stuff here is spinal fluid. This is the cerebellum. It should be filling it up, but it's atrophied. So when we see these kind of patients, our attempt is to find a cause because there is a small number of patients with this kind of atrophy where there is a treatable cause, like some of the antibodies and immunological problems. But a lot of them currently remain untreatable. So the aim of this talk is to give you an overview of what we call the degenerative ataxia. I'll talk a little bit about the research advances. And actually I've created a couple of slides to respond to your queries. So your uh, questions, push in, which can answer them, prepare kia oya. So cerebellar ataxia, you know, it controls, the cerebellum controls the accuracy and rhythm of movements. And, and, and many pe people here in the, in the audience have ataxia. I don't have to tell them what this is all about. So they have trouble with walking, their balance is not good. Uh, typically they walk like they're drunk. Uh, and that's, you know, in, in, the, in, 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 in our part of the world, you know, alcohol is not at all uncommon uh, every night. So we can tell the patient, this is what you feel like when you get a taxi. Uh, lurching, falling, uh, what we often find is uh, they will lose some skills uh, highly skilled activities before that. For example, they, they may not be able to ride a bike or motorbike or uh, go up the mountain or, or things like that. <clears throat> then it affects the coordination in the hands and the legs and in the hands, uh, you know, the neurologist usually does tests like finger to nose test, heel to shin test to find the coordination problem. When we test muscle strength, it remains very normal. You can have trouble with controlling your, uh, your trunk, your body, speech becomes abnormal. You can have trouble swallowing called bulbar symptoms. A lot of the patients have some visual symptoms because the control of the eye when jo, eye, eye jo, uh, movement hota hai, uska control brain uh, cerebellum karta hai, so you get nystagmus, which is kind of a, nystag you know, like a jerky movement. And there are many other illnesses that can look like ataxia, which we need to, uh, which we need to figure out. I want to stress the fact that ataxia is not a single disease. It is just, you know, I always tell my patients that doctors like to use mumbo jumbo, high complex words to mean something simple. So the simple thing is ataxia means balance problem. That's what it means. When you have a balance problem coming from the cerebellum, that is, that is ataxia. Not a single disease. It is related to many, many diseases. Some of them are non-genetic. So we always want to be careful that you have excluded these because many of them can be controlled or reversed. Uh, alcohol is one of the most common causes of ataxia. Uh, there are other toxins like epilepsy drugs. We do see a number of patients uh, who have problems with slowly progressive degeneration of the cerebellum later on in life with no family history. We don't yet know what this is. It's very similar to other similar illnesses. Alzheimer's disease, for example, causes degeneration of the frontal lobes and the parietal lobes. We don't know what causes it. Similarly, Parkinson, we don't know the cause of these sporadic neuroregenerations. But in the ataxia world, we are a little bit more lucky. We actually can find a cause for it, particularly genetic causes in about half the patients. And the genetics of ataxia is quite complex. And this is one of the problems we face in the field that there are so many different diseases, if you will. So one of the two of the most common ways diseases are inherited, one is autosomal dominance. So in the right hand on the bottom, you see the dominant inheritance where the disease passes on from one generation to the next. Uh, it can be transmitted by men like square or women can transmit it to the next generation. So the, this occurs because every gene, jo, gene hota hai, do, do copy hota hai, one from the dad, one from the mother, 
in autosomal dominant disease, only one copy has to be mutated. So here you have a father with ataxia has one copy of the gene that's normal, one copy of the gene that's abnormal. It transmits his normal copy to the, to the daughter, normal copy from the mother, the daughter is okay. But this son here gets his bad copy, normal copy from the mother, but has the disease. So the dominant inheritance. Recessive inheritance, you see that the father and mother have one copy that is mutated, have just a mutation, one copy, like in both of them are asymptomatic. But in this child here, one copy from the father, one copy from the mother, both are mutated, you get recessive. For example, free drug ataxia is a recessive disease. Some of them end up being carriers and others are completely unaffected. So let me talk a little bit about autosomal recessive ataxia. Um, very large number of genes. So over the last 10, 15 years, uh, we have this technology, which uh, I am pleased to learn that there, the, a lot more sequencing happens in India than here, it looks like. So this sequencing technology, what we call next generation sequencing has caught on. I've talked to a number of people. I was in a meeting in Hyderabad right before COVID, the genetics group, very impressed with the, the amount of sequencing going on. So this has allowed us to find many, many genes. So recessive attacks occurs with a large number of genes. Typically, this is onset in childhood. So one of the differences between degenerative ataxia and things like Alzheimer and Parkinson, the age of onset of ataxia can be very wide from childhood, uh, little babies, uh, young people, older people, so very wide. And that's because a lot of them are genetic and many of the recessive ataxias come on in, in, in teenagers and younger children. Family history may not be seen because you need both copies. Friedreich's ataxia is the most common autosomal recessive ataxia that we see uh, in, in, in large cities, maybe a quarter of the autosomal recessive ataxias are Friedreich's. This disorder called ataxia telangiectasia is less common. In fact, the, the, well, the only ataxia telangiectasia patients that I have personally seen uh, was in India when I spent three years at uh, Panth Hospital in New Delhi. I saw six cases of ataxia telangiectasia, never seen one here in the US in my clinic. The reason I bring this up is the, the pattern of recessive disorders is gonna be different in different parts of the world. And, and, and India with its large population is going to have a lot more of the rarer ataxias than we see here in the US. And that's, that's both a, a problem uh, for India, but also an opportunity to find treatments for these because there's gonna be a large number of these and one of the interesting things that I, you know, one of the one of my hobbies is to do what I call population genetics. I watch a lot of shows on population genetics. And one of the features of Indian society in general is what we call endogamous society. So we have groups of people who have been there in the subcontinent for very long periods of time, but they are not intermixed uh, very much. And that's part of our society, part of our culture. And, the, and that creates these founder effect mutations that persist in certain societies. All right, let me go back, go on to, so this is just a, a, a illustration of this. This is a guy from Germany who reviewed autosomal recessive ataxias in, 19, in 2018. He found that there are about 80 different genes where we call them autosomal recessive ataxias. Most of them are quite rare. But again, if you, if you look at the same, these genes in India, I think you'll find a lot more of these, most common being free drug ataxia. And then there are another hundred disorders where these, are, these disorders are not called ataxias, but ataxia occurs in these children and young people. And when a clinician looks at these people, they look like ataxia, but they're called something else. Let me talk a little bit about Friedreich's ataxia. Uh, this is the most common. Uh, it is an endococcation disease. So this mutation crept up in the pop human population after if you, look about, if you look at the evolution of how humans moved around the world, about 100,000 about, uh, 100, years ago, Homo sapiens comes out of Africa, gets into the Middle East. And that probably explains the fact that some of the oldest civilizations are in Egypt and the Middle East. Probably that's where Homo sapiens came out of Africa, started settling down, started developing agriculture, and then went both ways to the East, to South Asia, and then to the West, uh, to Europe. 
and at, at that point in time, there was a branch of hum Homo sapiens that branched off to the Orient, to, to, to China, to Japan, and, and what we call the Oriental countries. This mutation must have crept up after that population split off. So it occurs in uh, Europe, it occurs in the Middle East, it occurs in India, uh, it occurs in uh, Egypt, I believe, but not Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, uh, I suspect in India, I've been there a few times, that there is a north-south gradient. I'm not sure of this. I think there may be more free drugs in North India than in South India. And Dr. Paranik may comment on this. Typically teenagers, uh, we heard from uh, Dr. Swasti a few minutes ago, and uh, it looks like that's typical. There is a heart involvement. You get all the cerebellar signs. Um, I don't know whether I want to show this picture. I, I'm not going to uh, show you the video because it's typical free drugs attacks in a child. What we found out in 1997, 96, was that this is a mutation and this mutation is what we call a repeat expansion. This is a unique type of mutation. Most mutations are uh, one change, one molecular change in the DNA sequence. As you know, DNA is a long string of molecules, but here you have a repetitive sequence of these three molecules, guanine, adenine, adenine, and GAA. So it occurs like a string of beads and this string becomes longer, and when it becomes longer, it causes disease. In free drugs, this long string of GAA needs to occur in both copies from the father and the mother. And as you can see in a gene, uh, this is just a schematic of a gene. Uh, you have what we call a promoter region where the gene starts reading a message. This area called exon actually is responsible for making the protein, in this case, for taxin. But there are interspersed areas of the gene, which are called introns, which are not needed for this protein. These, these need to be processed out before you make the protein. And the GAA occurs in the, in the intronic sequence here. And we know now that this causes a problem in that, unlike normal gene, which makes a lot of protection, this doesn't make a protection. So we call this loss of function mutation. So this mutation causes reduction in protection, and that causes the problem. Complex slide. Uh, I'll try to summarize it. Uh, so you have a reduction in fretexin that causes free drexataxia. This shows you a cell. Uh, these are, this is how cell is organized. Now, when I was in medical school, the cell was a circle with a nucleus, another circle inside the cell, very static, very cartoonish picture of a cell. And I realized in the last 50 years, the cell is extraordinarily complex, extraordinarily active, extraordinarily, um, controlled. So now we know that here is the nucleus of the cell. It, it may, takes the message from the DNA, brings it out into the cytoplasm, makes a protein here. There are things in here that make the protein, that control the proteins. There are the little thing is in here called mitochondria. We actually think that these mitochondria are evolutionarily, millions of years ago, bacteria that got into unicellular organism now become part of our system. Th these are the places where we burn our energy. When we, when we take in carbohydrate, when, it, when we take fats, we burn it here to make energy. And so this is the mitochondria here. Uh, and uh, here is the cell wall. Here is what we call cytoplasm. And the mitochondria are the furnace. So carbohydrate being burned, fatty acids being burned. And we know that protection works within the mitochondria. I'm sorry for the complexity of this slide, but basically it, 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 it controls or it provides a certain a very key uh, uh, structures called iron sulfur clusters. So we need the protection protein to make a complex protein molecule called iron sulfur clusters. And these clusters are important for these energy metabolism that's happening within the mitochondria. And when you have a lack of protection, you have overload of iron because the iron is not being used in the mitochondria. So you have overload of iron here and you lose the function of this very complicated machinery that makes your energy, what we call ATP. Uh, also, uh, it also generates what we call oxidative stress, also called reactive oxygen species. So this we have learned pretty fast for medical medical advance over 25 years, we've found this all out and we figured out how to do this. So over the last 15, 20 years, we were doing trials targeting this oxidative stress that was going on. 
So that loss of protection leads to mitochondrial problems, impairment of synthesis of these enzymes, oxidative stress, iron overload. So there were trials get, trying to get rid of excess iron uh, antioxidants, uh, such as uh, CoQ10. None of this were very effective. Probably they target not the primary problem, but the downstream problem. And I'll come back to this, the, the, you can have a strategy to improve oxidative defense. And I'm, I'm gonna come back to this in a minute. What we are now looking at in the next 10 years or so is to go to the very source. Can we put the gene back? Everybody seems to be uh, excited by this group of molecules called CRISPR, which can actually edit the genetic mutation. And this is still far away in terms of human trials. There are strategies to make the gene work, even though you have the repeat, you can, in, you can improve the gene function. Um, so the, again, I will be, I'll simplify the slide. The, the one success we've had with clinical trials and free drugs ataxia is a compound called Omovexilone or RT408. This, we have done two trials. The, the second trial was the more definitive trial. We had 103 patients, multi-center between Europe and US, 48 weeks. Half of these children and young adults were on placebo, half got the real drug. And we measured ataxia using a neurological rating scale that we called MFARS. Let me not belabor this. This is the way I examine you and score you. And we find that patients who got the placebo worsen like normal free drug patients worsen by about two points or so. The people who got the OMA were significantly better at the end of 48 weeks, not dramatically significantly. This is almost one year worth of progression for free drug ataxia. And this seems to have persisted in our open label extension because all these patients are still taking the drug. Everybody is getting it. The placebo uh, people were switched to the, to the drug. In children, the effect was actually much better. Uh, than in the in the whole group, and I won't belabor all these sub details. But it, it, this is a positive study; uh, it continues to be positive, and the FDA is looking at it. This may be approved as a real drug for free drug ataxia. There are things on the pipeline that I think will be uh, helpful for free drug ataxia in a more definitive way. That is going to the source. Can we get the 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 protection production to go up? We have understood a lot about how the gene shuts down because here what you see is a string of DNA molecules and the promoter area of the gene. This is where the gene starts making the copy or making the protein or making the mRNA. And this gene is regulated with proteins called histones. There are proteins that kind of control the gene and when the histones have these yellow things that call acetylation, histone tail, when it is acetylated, the gene is open and can make it make protein. When the acetylation is lost, the gene is shut down. What happens when you have a free drugs mutation, when that GAA size is long, this happens. The histones get a clump together around the promoter sequence. You do, you, the acetylation is lost and the gene is shut down. But if you improve the acetylation, you can open up the gene. And the way to do that is to in inhibit an enzyme called HDAC, histone deacetylase inhibitors. We have a number of molecules that will improve the acetylation of the promoter histones and be able to increase the production of protection. These have had some trials and these, more of these are in development, they're called HDAC inhibitors. There are other things that are coming in the, in, in the way. There are synthetic transcription molecules in fact, this particular group of molecules have been uh, generated by uh, Dr. Ansari, who also has his roots in Delhi and works in Memphis now. He's a biochemist uh, who has developed these synthetic transcription molecules that can brute force improve the production of protection. So this is one way to improve protection production. The other one is a strategy developed using what we call cell penetrating peptides because Proteins like protection are big molecules. You cannot just inject it into your muscle and put it into where it needs, into the brain. But there are certain peptides called cell penetrating peptides. Here we have a, a, an experiment where protection was fused with a protein called TAT. And this TAT protection is able to take the protection into the cells, into the mitochondria. And now this uh, has gone from the laboratory to clinical uh, trial. 
uh, this compound is called CT1601. Uh, they actually did a, a, about 40 patients uh, initial trial just for safety. Uh, this is finished. Now we're gonna go into the open label extension. We're gonna continue to inject uh, CT1601 in the patients who got this last year to see if it has any effect on free drugs ataxia. So this is progressing into larger clinical trials. At the University of uh, Florida, I have the um, good fortune to collaborate with this group called the Powell Gene Therapy Center. Uh, so the question is, can we put the gene back? And we can do this uh, using what we call vectors. Part of the problem with a lot of the new drugs that we are developing, they're all much larger than the average drug like aspirin and aspirin and uh, whatever else you know, antibiotics, they are called small molecules. In fact, Dr. Professor Muthalia probably is an expert on small molecules. They can get into cells, brain, neurons very easily, but many of the, the agents that we're trying to develop for these genetic diseases are very large and very hard to get into your system. And that's true for genes. So they need vectors. Uh, there are many kinds of vectors, but the vector that is currently in fashion because it's been shown to be most, uh, most uh, least toxic and easy to get around is called adeno-associated virus. So this is actually a virus. This virus is uh, relative to a cold virus. Uh, originally a virus called adenovirus was used for gene therapy, but it, it was too toxic. But the interesting thing about AAV is that it does not cause human disease. We all get infected by AAV even when we are, many of us get infected by AAV when we are young. Uh, it doesn't give you any problems. It doesn't cause uh, any problems in the average person. For gene therapy, we have to use a big dose of this. So we do run into some problems with it. It's got a, a small number of genes, a uh, couple of different genes in, inside it. And it's got these regulatory regions. And what the laboratory is able to do is to put your gene that we want to put into your system inside the virus. So we got we take out the viral genes. So the genes of your virus may usko nikal dete hain, uske baad e hamara jo gene hai, usko insert kar dete hain. So this is called a transgene. So this is the construct in the UF lab. Uh, this is the human frataxin. Uh, it has got some regulatory regions. We have to regulate the gene and then um, it is put into the virus and the virus will be injected. Right now we're doing mice experiments. We're doing toxicity in monkeys. So virus, so it will go through the vein, um, into the neurons, into the muscle, wherever it needs to go. It goes into the cell and the capsid, the protein of the virus, uh, the covering uh, is removed. Your gene is released. It kind of sits, in the case of neurons, this gene, once you put it in after one injection, theoretically, it should sit there for your life. Now that may or may not be the case really, but this kind of gene therapy, we are thinking of one injection, that's it. And, and that's been possible for some other diseases. And it'll, it is expected to produce the frataxin for the rest of your life. So if it succeeds, that'll be great, but it needs a lot of work. So here it shows you an animal experiment where we show that when you inject bigger, bigger and bigger doses of these uh, viruses, you can get a better survival in these mice, which have got Friedreich's ataxia. Uh, actually, they actually have a, a knockout of the frataxin in the heart. So these are cardiac problems with the Friedreich's mouse and, and they don't survive, but you can make it survive better with uh, doses of frataxin uh, gene therapy. The current human, um, Plan trial uh, right now, we are still in very much planning stage. We want to give a combined dose uh, intravenously for the heart and intrathecally into the spinal fluid so you can get into the brain, various parts of the brain. So this is in the planning stage at this point in time. There are other pharmaceutical companies, I believe Pfizer and uh, I don't remember who else, Takeda, PTC, many of them are involved in planning for gene therapy for Friedex ataxia. As I mentioned before, the problem is, of course, free drugs ataxia is the most common, but hundreds of genes cause autosomal recessive cerebellar ataxias. And I would certainly bet that unlike Europe and USA, in India, you're likely to see many more of these than in the West. Again, because of the larger population, number one, and number two, because of the, uh, because of the more endogamous societies, uh, founder effects and consanguinity rate, 
And I do see this in India in general. So this is, for example, uh, the common ARCA genes. In fact, there are hundreds of different genes, but I just put names of different genes uh, that cause um, uh, uh, the more common of these in, in published literature. There is an interesting paper from India. I think this came from Ames. Uh, they did gene sequencing in 101, 141 patients with cerebellar ataxia. They did not include Friedreichs because they already knew who had the Friedreichs gene. So these were patients who did not have Friedreichs and the ones in red, ataxia, telangiectasia, senataxin, SACS, and vitamin E deficiency. This is called tocopherol transfer protein. Uh, these were the most common in this, in the, among these patients, but many of them are very rare. I would also like to say that these autosomal recessive mutations usually lead to loss of function. I mean, I think AT is not uncommon in India, ataxia telangiectasia. This comes on a bit earlier than Friedreich's, causes a lot more problems than Friedreich's. So this needs urgent treatment. And ultimately maybe replacing the gene or maybe one of the ways to treat these autosomal recessive ataxias. Well, I want to spend a few minutes on what we call autosomal dominant ataxias, uh, what we call spinal cerebellar ataxias. These are progressive problems. They are dominantly inherited. So they go from generation to generation, also called SCAs. Uh, there are many, many genes. I think um, this number may have changed. I say 47 genes, but more, probably more than that. So the number is the, the particular gene. SCA1 was the very first gene we figured out. There are more than 50 or so genes that cause spinal cerebellar ataxias. But the common spinal cerebellar ataxias uh, are related to repeat expansions, just like the free drugs, where I showed you that there was a sequence called GAA, which becomes longer. In the case of SCAs, there are similar what we call repetitive sequences, where the molecules that are strung together to make genes become longer. And I'll show you a picture of this in a minute. So this is giving you a schematic of what we call unstable expansions. And I, uh, I, did, I have spent all my 30 years of my career on various unstable expansion diseases. So just to give you a schematic, this is what a, a gene kind of looks like. DNA is a long string of molecules, huge number of molecules. I don't remember, 3 billion pairs of these molecules uh, in, uh, in the human genome. Most genes, well, all genes have a promoter area uh, where, it, where it starts copying. There are the introns. You see the free drugs expansion and intron. The SCA genes, are mostly in coding regions. So these are uh, what we call a repetitive tract of CAG, cytosine, adenine, guanine, that becomes longer. And these repeats occur in coding regions. And uh, one is one of these, a Texan 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 17. These are all repeats that become longer in coding sequences. And the term CAG, that these three molecules, as you know, DNA is a message. So these three molecules make a insert an amino acid called glutamine into the protein. So the, the Q is, stands for glutamine. So when these genes make a protein, there is a string of glutamines in the protein. So poly Q ataxic editing. So, so just to give you an example. Now I want to talk a little bit about SCAR12 because this is, uh, as uh, Dr. Puranik will tell you, uh, kind of a uniquely Indian disease. Um, again, these polyglutamine ataxias, where you have a repeat expansion in the CAG tract within the coding regions, occurs in each generation. Most of them come out in the younger adults, not teenagers. It can happen in teenagers. It can happen in younger people. But it's father to, I mean, a parent to child, child to parent, uh, and a child to the next generation, on and on. There is what we call anticipation in these families. A lot of times the disease starts coming earlier and earlier as you go down the generation. They not only get a test, but many other parts of the brain are affected, leading to a variety of other neurological signs like spasticity. Your eyes may not move well. Uh, your peripheral nerve can get degenerated. Some of them have visual loss, et cetera, et cetera. Cognition is not a major problem in the majority of ataxias. 
So the size of this expansion as it elongates can go from, you know, it can change from one person to the next within the same family. And the larger the size, the longer the repeat, the earlier you get the disease and more severe the disease. So unlike the recessive ataxia, as where I said, it's a loss of function where the gene is not working, gene is not making a protein. The, the major attempt is to get the protein into, into a working shape within those people. In the SCAs, um, we call it gain of function. So basically gene is not shut down. So remember that in this group of diseases, one copy has that long expansion, the other is okay. So the normal copy is making a normal protein. So you pretty much have the normal. For example, if you have SCA1, the protein is called ataxin1, and you're making normal ataxin1 from your normal copy, but you're making an abnormal ataxin1 from your mutated or abnormal copy that you got from your affected parent. And in 1997, I was fortunate enough to collaborate in this paper where we found that this ataxin in this case, actually, ataxin three, you can see it making a big precipitate, like a big clump, uh, like you see with, um, if you put egg white in the water, you kind of precipitate it. That's what you see within the nucleus. This is a nerve cell in the brainstem of a patient with SCA3. This is the nucleus and you see this. You don't see this in normal individuals. This is a common theme for polyglutamine ataxias. And what we find is that these altered, the, the, the mutant protein, the abnormal protein aggregates, it probably causes a lot of problem within the nucleus. It also does not do its normal job well. So it's not really gain of function, but it's also kind of loss of function in a way. And these proteins are very important within the cell. And, but overall, we think that if you can stop the mutated allele from making this abnormal protein, if you can shut down the gene, the geneticists use the term genetic knockdown, you can perhaps influence the disease. Now you'll ask, okay, what if you shut down the gene? What, you know, you, you'll be shutting down the mutant allele. You can also be knocking down the normal copy. Isn't that going to hurt me? Well, what we now know is that if you take these genes like ataxin one or ataxin three, and you completely inactivate in a mouse, for example, these mice do okay. So these are, what we call null mutants. So it seems as though an adult organism does not miss these proteins if you knock it off. So that's the, that's the, the idea about protein gain of function. And some of these non-coding expansions, you can get RNA. So the, 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 the gene makes DNA to RNA, RNA to protein. So here you see, this is actually not ataxia, this is myotonic dystrophy. And these blue blobs are nucleus of fibroblasts, these are the cell nuclei, and you can see these pink dots, these are RNA from the long uh, repeat that clumps, just like the protein here, this is the RNA that clumps here. Just to give you an illustration of this, is the, so normally you have these CAG repeats and the protein has say five glutamines here because you had five CAG repeats. But when the CAG repeat becomes longer, you get a long glutamine tract in the protein. And this protein does not fold right. It kind of aggregates. And then it, as I said, it, it kind of disturbs almost everything in the nerve cell. I won't go into the details of it. So the treatment strategy in SCA is to reduce the load of mutant protein. And we find that one of the kind of molecules that we can do this with is called RNA-based. So this is novel type of therapeutics. So again, the central dogma of biochemistry, the genes are made of DNA. It has to be copied into what we call RNA or ribonucleic acid. And then this is converted into a protein. A message is read and the cell makes a protein. And these proteins are very, very important for everything that we do. Many, many proteins are 14,000 proteins, at least in the human system. And there are a number of these molecules called antisense molecules. Uh, interfering RNA, short hairpin RNA, micro RNA, all these are designed to knock down specific genes of interest. So this shows you an example of an experiment done in the laboratory of Dr. Stefan Pulse, who's a friend of mine in Salt Lake City in Utah. And this is a animal model for SCA2. Uh, the red bar is treated with salt and the blue bars are animals treated with this antisense that will knock down the ataxin 2. You can see that when you inject the salt, this is the level of ataxin 2 in these mice. 
it knocks down the ataxin 2. So it is reducing the ataxin 2 protein. And you see their balance function gets better and better over a period of time compared to the saline treated mice. They're, they're better. So this is the kind of treatment uh, that is coming into vogue. Uh, I, I believe that I will be in a trial that is being run by Biogen for SCAR3 using one of these antisense in the next year or so. Just give you an example, uh, again, of, this is what we call a antisense oligonucleotide. These are designer molecules. These are short stretches of genetic material, nucleotides. Then it's given a drug backbone. There are two mechanisms for uh, antisense um, nuclear molecules. They attract an enzyme called RNase H. And this enzyme destroys the RNA that you're targeting. And in the case of ataxias, we want to destroy the particular RNA coming from the ataxin one or two or three, depending on the, the particular disease. The SHRNAs use another type of mechanism. And again, I don't want to go into the details of this at this point in time. So I'm coming towards the end of it. I think I'm being pretty short because I want to leave time for questions and maybe speculate about the complexities of these things. But I do want to spend one slide on spinal cellular attacks at type 12. Um, I uh, had the fortune, uh, I think I had interacted with Dr. Vijay Chandran, that's not ring, ring a bell. Uh, he's, a he's kind of a genetics person in, in Bangalore, uh, right before COVID. We thought of uh, holding a, a brainstorming session on SCAR 12 in Bangalore. Uh, got canceled by uh, the COVID. I don't know what has happened to it. So I started looking into SCAR12. As you know, this is a disorder uh, while it has been described in the US and Germany and, and, and the Far East. Uh, it is very prevalent in India. Uh, it is autosomal dominant, uh, typically comes on in 30s and 40s and 50s. Tremor, cerebellar sign, this disorder has some additional features like they have psychiatric disturbances, cognitive like memory problems. Some of them look like Parkinson's. So depending on where the mutation is expressed, you can have a wide variety of clinical problems in the brain. It is a CAG repeat expansion, but it does not look as if it is a polyglutamine like one, two, or three. And the evidence for this is still kind of minimal and that's what I found. So uh, interestingly, this it looks as though this repeat is not in the coding region. It is in what we call the promoter region. So it seems to be occurring in the promoter region of the, of the gene. So this is the very beginning of the gene where the gene starts working in a normal nucleus. And the protein, you know, like all proteins, is it's a very complex situation. It, it is a protein that controls another protein that we call phosphatase PP2A. So the, this protein where the gene, uh, the gene is called PPP2 or 2B, and this makes a protein, and this protein in turn controls another protein called phosphatase PP2A. Um, so you can see the complexity of this. This is why it makes it so difficult to design treatments. And I had a chance to kind of look at this situation and, it's very interesting. As I mentioned before, I'm told that something like a human organism makes more than 14,000 proteins. And these proteins are complex functions. Uh, these proteins are not static. When you breathe, when you run, when you have a fever, when you eat, all these are changing constantly. Those of who your engineers, you know about the feed feedback loops and you control systems. These are exquisitely organized in human organisms and other organisms. And one way the proteins are controlled is by adding a phosphate to the protein. And this is called phosphorylation. And I'm told that even though there are 14,000 proteins in the human system, there are more than 1 million phosphorylation sites because proteins can be phosphorylated. I think Dr. Mutelia probably is an expert in this area, if I remember right. <laughs> So huge number okay. of phosphorylases, and it turns out that there are more than 500 protein kinases that phosphorylate these proteins. But at the same time, you also need to take off the phosphorylate using a protein phosphatase. So this is how the protein is switched on and off depending on what, is, what it needs to do. Uh, phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. So here you have a phosphatase uh, which dephosphorylates proteins 
And that's where the problem is. It's not in the phosphatase gene, but it is in a regulatory subunit. And uh, this particular subunit is exclusive to neuronal tissues. It does not occur in other parts of the body. It's interesting that uh, the problem is in the B2 uh, subunit and this B1, B2. I mean, the complexity of this is enormous. And it turns out that B2, if, if the subunit B2 attaches to phosphatase, 2A, it takes the protein to mitochondria, whereas uh, B1 targets the cytoplasm. And if the protein gets to the mitochondria, it causes the mitochondria to fragment and, and degenerate. So this may be one of the mechanisms because the, the available evidence suggests that when you have this repeat expansion in the SCAR12, this protein is increased, beta 2, uh, maybe. Maybe, we don't know the, the entire evidence for this. So if so, is it targeting the mitochondria and maybe mitochondria becoming abnormal? So can we reduce, can we inhibit this targeting and can we make the disease better? So this is the story about SCRA12. Um, and I'd like to actually say that there is a, a scientist, uh, and I don't know that Dr. Motelian knows her, her name is Bertoletti. She's at Cambridge. And I actually sent her an email asking her about phosphatase inhibition because inhibiting phosphatase is not an easy thing to do because it'll, it'll be very toxic. Uh, but she has some ideas about selectively inhibiting phosphatase for treating such disorders. So it may be somebody that, may, that can help out this disease. These complex treatments, a lot of problems to be resolved. A biodistribution, can we get these drugs? They're very large molecular weight in the right place, in the right amount. Um, manufacturing these is a real problem. Um, one of the skills that Florida developed long ago, but now being increasingly developed by industry is to develop vector, uh, clinical grade vector. For example, the viral vectors to make it clinical grade is complex, but it's getting better. Toxicity, have immune responses, um, how long, when should we treat? How long should we treat? Interesting about viral vectors, for example, this is data that in a meeting from one of the companies called Avexis, if you do a single viral vector injection in mice, it lasts for 250 days in human, non-human primates and monkeys, at least for 15 years. In the hemophilia trials, the gene therapy, single injection is effective for five years or more. We worry about changing other genes when we target genes for treatment. And then on the clinical side, how to measure the disease and prove that the thing works is, is, is very complex. So there are a lot of complexities, particularly in rare diseases. And one of the uh, major roles a country like India can play is in clinical trials. If you get an infrastructure right, because the patient population is so large to, to, to meet the kind of patient population one needs for clinical trials may be easier in South Asia than, than in the US or the Europe. Now, in the last two, three slides, I'm actually targeting some of the queries that were sent to me uh, uh, by your group. Um, I think I've covered most of the queries uh, in one way or the other in the last couple of slides. One was uh, preventing the disease from transmitting to the next generation. So this requires skill genetic testing and uh, skill counseling. So you have increasing availability of genetic tests. Um, so you can make a precise diagnosis to do prevention. You really need in a particular family, what is it that the disease that you have? What is the gene that is in the family? You cannot guess at it. You have to be really sure by doing DNA testing. And then there is this phenomenon that we call predictive testing. So people come to us who are, who are children of people with an SCA. They're at risk. They have a 50% risk. Um, and they say, you know, we are asked them, why do you want to know? Because we don't have a good treatment. If we find you're positive, what are you going to do about it? Why do you want to know? And we want to find out. A lot of them are wanting to know because for reproductive strategies, they're getting to a stage where they're getting married and they want to have children. They, want, they don't want the disease to spread to the next generation. So if they find out that they have the mutation, they may, they may say, look, we're not going to have children or adopt children or something like that. So uh, so there are, and the others are getting tests for things like, I want to know period, uh, which is a bit more of a philosophy uh, in the West than I remember uh, India as it was 50 years ago that may have changed now. 
um, also occupation uh, careers. Uh, do I want to be a roof, uh, roof repairman versus a uh, sedentary job sort of thing. Cons, of course, you know, depression, anxiety, when you find that you have a positive test, uh, <clears throat> there is literature suggesting that even a negative test in a family, some people get depressed, what we call survivor guilt. Why did I not get it, but my brother has it sort of thing. So it's called survivor guilt. There are reproductive strategies, pre-implantation genetic, PGD, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis uh, is becoming fairly easily available here. Uh, I often find that these new technologies are easier in India available more than here sometimes I find that. And that's basically testing the embryo in a test tube baby situation for dominant diseases. So you, you go to a in vitro fertilization clinic uh, they generate embryos and the embryos are tested in a three or five cell stage. They pluck out one cell and detect whether the mutation is present or not. Uh, so for example, let's say a 60 year old woman has ataxia, has a 35 year old son and who wants to have a child. So he does not want to know whether he's carrying the gene or not. So the couple can go for PGD, <clears throat> they conceive a baby by IVF, and the fertility clinic will implant only the embryo that does not have a mutation. If they find a mutation in the embryo, they will not inform the father that he has the mutation. He doesn't want to know. They will in insert an embryo that is not mutated. So you can have that without doing predictive testing. For recessive ataxia, you need spousal counseling. So if you are, a, if, for example, if, if somebody has um, a, a recessive gene, the spouse has to carry the same gene to have an affected child. We see this in free drugs and ataxial injectation. The free drugs carrier rate in Western societies is one in 90. So one in 90 people carry one copy that's mutated. I don't know the carrier rate in South Asia. It's probably less uh, based on my, uh, you know, just thinking. And finally, um, when effective therapy has become available, earlier and earlier diagnosis is important. Um, and some of these uh, things where you have uh, therapies, you know, getting into newborn screening. So when the new babies are born, you can screen them. We, we're not gonna do this for SCA or free drugs because we don't have a treatment for it. No, no, no reason to find out. Um, so the, I think that is one of the questions in the, in the queries that are sent to me, what are the preventive strategies? Now, practical strategies, these deal with many of the other queries that were post their lifestyle. Always counsel my patients to maintain very good general health. Um, that's important for all of us, but for somebody with ataxia, it's even more important. Maintain your weight, do not become diabetic. Smoking is not good. Excessive alcohol is bad for your cerebellum. So I always counsel against, you know, I don't mind some of my patients having a glass of wine a couple of times a week with dinner, which they do here, but I don't know what, you know, um, you know, we have a different societal norms for alcohol. A couple of nutritional supplements, big doses of vitamin B6 is toxic to your balance. Uh, B6 maximum dose is about 10 milligram per day. Do not take more than that. I avoid zinc supplements because some people are taking a lot of zinc. I don't know what the, what the situation in South Asia because zinc interferes with copper absorption and you don't want that. We recommend aerobic activity, 150 minutes per week. In people with motor problems, I usually say buy a stationary bike, uh, which is very commonly available here, do a bike like that. But again, that's uh, again, an issue that needs to be tailored to the local situation. Many of our patients take antioxidants. Um, I don't know the value of it. Many of them are taking something called coenzyme Q10 and Co CoQ is actually a part of the mitochondrial metabolism. Curcumin uh, has come, come up in my uh, um, view because this actually has properties that are similar to the omavalon that has been used in free dysotexia. It is a, what we call an NRF2 activator. So I tell a lot of my patients to take curcumin tablets, but an Indian diet probably has enough curcumin anyway, so right, so it, this is something good. Balance targeted physical therapy, and from your introduction, I suspect that you have a lot of skills in that direction, more perhaps than we do here, you know, that training the balance, you know, standing on 
form and standing with feet together. Physical therapy will help you for short periods of time, but usually it wears off after a few months and you have to do it again and again as much as possible. So, you know, it is, it is not easy. Um, many patients and families deal with very complicated situation with these diseases. It affects the patient, it affects families. Um, it's, very not, it's not easy to maintain that kind of general lifestyle. Uh, you get depressed, you do things that are bad for bad yourselves, but I mean, that's where we are. I always refer my patients to go to websites called assistive technologies website. There is one shown here, for example, a lot of my patients come back to me and teach me things that they have learned. You know, they can use cell phones to call, you know, uh, monitor their lights and lock their doors and uh, turn their TV on. And, uh, you know, all kinds of assistive technologies are becoming available. Um, and again, uh, you know, given the IT progress in India, I suspect that some of these can be developed or easily obtained in that area. Symptom management is a part of our clinical practice. Um, somebody asked about memory issues. Severe memory problems is not common in the ataxias. There are some of them that can do it, but it's not at all common. You don't get a memory problem that looks like Alzheimer's disease or dementia. Many of them, what we have, they have executive dysfunction. So they have some trouble with complicated planned tasks. The only approach to this, of course, all the general health helps make sure your physicians make sure that you don't have other things like thyroid or heart is not working well, lungs are not working well, because these can all cause these problems. So look for correctable things, vitamin deficiencies, weight loss, nutritional problems. A lot of our patients have urgency of urination with the bladder, you know, you have to go right away. There are drugs available. These drugs are mostly what we call atropine-like. Uh, these are many, many drugs that quiet down the bladder. They, lessen that urgency. Uro, uh, urolog urologists may be able to help. When you have a bladder that doesn't work well, uh, you have a higher risk for bladder infections. And I don't know what the best strategy is. I always tell my patients to keep their bladder empty as much as possible. Uh, maybe go frequently do a voiding schedule. Drooling and mouth watering. Uh, again, there are drugs like atropine-like drugs. In, in the US, we have something called scopolamine patch which we put on the skin and it is actually scopolamine is like atropine. It dries out your saliva. Some of these, uh, I think there is atropine that has been designed as an eye drop. When you go to the eye doctor, this is what they use to dilate your pupils. And some of our patients actually swab that eye drop in the mouth and then makes the mouth a little bit drier. So that may be another way to do it. Botox has been used, injecting Botox to saliva, but I usually do not recommend it because you know, if you inject Botox there, you may lose your swallowing, you know, more trouble with swallowing because you're very close to the throat. Somebody asked about sleep. Uh, sleep disturbances are very common in ataxias in general, no matter what, free drugs or um, SCAs, more in SCAs. And you can diagnose this with a good sleep testing or sleep doctor. Most sleep apneas are treated with devices uh, called um, um, CP CPAP. Uh, um, uh, it's a, God, I forget the, the name for it. But anyway, it's a, it's a nighttime device, uh, positive pressure. So continuous positive pressure devices, CPAPs. Emotional effects are not at all uncommon. Uh, depression is not, uh, uh, you know, it's easy to understand. Some people get what we call pseudobulbar effect, uh, easy laughing, easy crying. They have an unusual emotional uh, feature to it. Um, this has been treated in ALS with this combination of drug called dextromethorphan and quinidine. And in the US, it's marketed as a drug called New Dexter. So these people often are not depressed, but they cry like a little sad thing in the TV it will make them cry for five minutes. That's called pseudobulbar effect, or sometimes they laugh for five minutes. So that kind of symptom perhaps may respond to this drug. Uh, dextromethorphan is actually a cough syrup. It is available freely everywhere. So you may want to just try dextromethorphan if new, new dextra is not available. Most of the time vision symptoms like double vision is because of the trouble with eye movement. Um, not easy to treat. A good ophthalmologist can help you with prisms. We always recommend the respiratory infection prevention strategy. With COVID, this has become easy to talk to patients, get vaccinated, flu vaccine, COVID vaccine. Um, 
and social distancing has become a word that I can use in clinical practice now. People do not understand it before, but it's important for patients. So I want to start there. I hope I've kept the time. Um, and I know I've covered a lot and I'm happy to entertain questions. So um, apologies, I'm sorry. I will try to answer questions. Yeah, so um, so thank you. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for such an insightful talk. Um, and yes, really, uh, taxia is a very complex disease with so many uh, nuances, but we are very happy to see uh, that so much research is going on and there are so many proposed treatments. Um, right. Yes. Uh, I would like to announce to our listeners that we will shortly enter the qu uh, question and answer session. But before that, I would like to request Dr. Puranik. Sir, I want to summarize this lecture in Hindi so that you can all... Okay. Sab... And one thing I'll say about it. Okay. I'll say about it. Okay. I'll say about it. Okay. I'm, I'm sliding into retirement. I, I part -time work part-time. Hai. All my work is translational research. Jo patients uh, they ye, ye SCA, free drugs, or myotonic dystrophy dekhte hain bas, aur kuch nahi dekhte hain. Lekin uh, ab COVID to kam ho gaya, to main India mein aana chahta hoon. To wahan. Sir, you are most welcome here. Jo bhi uh, kaam kar sakte hain. Bilkul sir. Bilkul sir, most welcome. That would be great. We're more than happy to welcome you. So, so we are happy to collaborate and uh, and uh, you know, um, I have an interest in these disorders. My retirement hobby is to be in the family. We can time kar sakte hai, like in long distance or even in person, uh, like the opportunity to work with people there. So there is something called the Ataxia Global Initiative which is being organized by uh, Europeans uh, primarily. I have not been so much in, well, I'm part of the, well. Please reshare the screen, please. Sorry? Oh, the, sorry. Meta screen? Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but the I can't see you. Please so stop please. sharing your screen. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Please. Oh boy, what happened there? Let me see. Let me um, down. Yeah, wait. Okay, stop share. How about now? That's it. That's great. Oh, sorry. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, my Kartan, yeah, a Taxi Global Initiative. I'm sure uh, Professor Yasso knows about it, and other people in the in India. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, I'm not that active because I was busy with other things. Like in, uh, it's an opportunity to collaborate. I think the Brazilian, South Asian, uh, South Americans are into it and South Taiwanese uh, in this global initiative. Um, I think there will be a meeting, uh, you know, Orlando May this year, the, the, the typically every other year, there's an ataxia research meeting that we do with Europeans. Um, it's been sporadic because of the COVID. <laughs> Uh, I know that the in-person meeting was canceled this year, uh, but the the positive about COVID, uh, people can do it by Zoom now, right? So you yes, don't have to travel. Um, the, I think there was a meeting of the global initiative people in Orlando. I've been meaning to do a little bit more work, but I was spread thin by other things. And I didn't want to do that, but it's an opportunity for the group in India to to connect. And I can send the link yeah, to you yeah. folks. Um, yeah. All right. Acha, ठीक है. इससे पहले कि मैं सर के व्याख्यान का बहुत संक्षिप्त में हिंदी में रूपांतरण करूं मैं मैंने देखा है डॉक्टर रमैया मुथायला ने हाथ उठाया अभी कुछ कहना चाहते हैं हम जरूर आपसे सुनना चाहेंगे. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, my question is really not my question. I have been asked this question by many, many ataxia patients. The question is that how can they participate in the clinical trials that are being conducted in the United States and other countries? Right. 
Um, um, so what I, so there are opportunities and difficulties, right? So um, the, the RIATA trial was uh, US and Europe uh, and uh, the come upcoming SCA trial probably also Europe and, and US. Um, most of us who do trials have built up infrastructure um, and that is important and maybe identify, I mean, if you want, if you think about it in an organized way, if you look at a country like India, I think, I think there are clinical research organizations in India, but- There are, there are many and there are many centers, many sites which right. are having very robust ethics committees and all the protocols are- Right, so, so that's important. So for example, uh, in our institution, I have, we are lucky to have something called the Clinical Transnational Science Institute. It is funded by the NIH. So it is a research only space where we have clinic rooms, uh, where we have a research only pharmacy. We have a research only clinical lab. This is not a research lab. So when you do research studies, you know, the specimens are processed in the lab, it does not get mixed up with the hospital things. And in our department, in my division, we have about six research coordinators. So that's kind of an infrastructure. Now, you know, it is complex. And uh, uh, I don't know whether that needs to be duplicated. We, you know, you can take that scheme, but think about it. How do you adapt it to a country where the resources may be a little bit less? Um, uh, half the time of my coordinators is spent on regulatory documents. There are so many paper, you know, each person generates a 1500 page binder for one study, one patient. So you can imagine the amount of paperwork that goes on as the regulatory agency. So you need to, it almost looks to me as though South Asia, you know, India, for example, needs to develop its own little way to do it. How do you simplify this if you can? Yes, we do. Uh, there are a large number of multinational trials in which, and very prestigious trials, which have been published in leading journals like Right. and Lancet in which the sites in India have been uh, good very sites. active. Yeah, yeah very so I'm sure it has progressed very well. So, yeah. so basically that's one thing. Um, I think uh, again, people like me and uh, Dr. Matalia can probably keep this in mind and build the collaboration needed. I, I, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, the registries are important. I think developing a registry where you at least have a contact information of patients where they are and what the, what they have. Um, I think one of the things I've encouraged people here to do, the foundations to do, which they've not taken up and it may be very useful, is to use social media to generate select patient groups on social media. So yeah. I know that there are, it may already be there. So if you, you let the patient groups, okay, do a, a free drexatexia uh, face group, Facebook group or a Twitter group or whatever it is. So that way you literally can build the rare diseases into a nationwide community that's yes. in touch with each other, the patients themselves and having the patients. In fact, one of the advantages in India would be to generate the, 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 the number of patients needed for rare disease research, which yes. is very difficult in other countries. And you have a you know, basic amount of data. Who are the, who are the patients? Do they have a DNA diagnosis? What is their basic characteristics? Repeat numbers, uh, age of onset, and then you know use the outcome measures that are already out there. Uh, you know, one of the things in neurology that we've seen is we still use a lot of clinical outcome measures. We're not using complicated technology. You know, MRI is coming into that. But whether that will be more useful than clinical, we don't know. And we are handicapped by clinical outcome measures, but that's the only thing we have. And it doesn't need a lot of equipment to do it. And, and developing additional clinical methodology in patient populations can be a real big thing in India because you have so many patients. Uh, one of the things I thought about, for example, we use activities of daily, daily living scale mm most activities of daily living scale target more advanced patients. And now therapies are being targeted to very early patients. So develop an ADL for 
people who can still work, who can still take a bus, who can still go to the bank, um, can we develop a scale that will assess those daily functions in a quantitative fashion? So, you know, this kind of qualitative research, as they call it, uh, and developing patient reported outcome measures can be done very nicely. So combining that with a registry, you have a trial ready population and then you have to have an <clears throat> infrastructure in a few centers. Forgive me for continuing this discussion. Uh, at, um, in our organization, we try to do the registries or databases, however you call it. Uh, and we were successfully able to do it at the LV Press Eye Institute for Eye Diseases. But other organizations are not really supporting that event. They want to keep it their data themselves. They have a reason, I respect that. But something, uh, if they really wanted a general uh, outcome, good outcome, they should be able to share it with the good intentions. Yes. That's my comment. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's, uh, and I know that the Friedreichs at Texas Research Alliance, FARA, has built an international <clears throat> registry. I don't know, somebody- I, I spoke audience. to, I spoke to Ron uh, Bartok yeah, uh, yeah. quite often. And in fact, he, uh, at one time, he and I thought that we could have a, clinical trial training course for the uh, Fredericks Ataxia group. But, you know, there are always some politics come here and there, and we were yeah. not able to make it happen. And particularly, we need the cooperation from the patients as well. And they should come out and tell that this is who we are. And it's a big problem, as you know very well. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll work hard whatever it takes you know this our goal we want our patients to be better and get all the things that they can get i think that's a goal of uh, ours as well as the aas and everybody's and hopefully we'll be able to do it in the future uh, on behalf of a large number of principal investigators from india i can reassure that there are many sites and many principal investigators who will do a good job if uh, sponsors from North America and Europe plan to induce uh, induct uh, Indian centers as a part of multicenter trials for new upcoming drugs for the treatment of ataxia. Of course, your other suggestion that we should have a large registry and we should have a longitudinal observation data, that certainly is important. And I think us will play a role. Us is having a very robust uh, uh, WhatsApp group. We are not so popular on Twitter for that purpose, uh, but we have a good uh, WhatsApp group. Again, not much on Facebook for this purpose. So I think uh, uh, Archie, uh, sh should I do a summary or we can skip the summary part, a uh, Hindi summary part? Sir, you can uh, do the summary uh, as you like. Yeah, sure. Yes, sir. You keep it as short as possible. Yeah, and, uh, sir, you Hindi in Hindi, we will to understand this in today's talk better So, first of all, I am giving to Dr. Subramani. And I want to tell you a story for Hindi Shrotaon. It is an English story. That when we get a new knowledge or a new knowledge from the original source, it is an English story from the horse's mouth. We have heard a story from कि अटेक्सिया के अंदर क्या सत्य है क्या नया है क्या वैज्ञानिक है क्या साइंटिफिक है मेनी थैंक्स फॉर गेटिंग द हॉर्सेस माउथ इंफॉर्मेशन अबाउट व्हाट इज लेटेस्ट व्हाट इज सबसे नया क्या है सबसे अध्ययनतन क्या है इसके लिए हम बहुत बहुत आभारी हैं तो डॉक्टर सुब्रमण्यम ने बताया कि जो विषय है बहुत जटिल है और उन्होंने बताया कि जी जो जेनेटिक रिवॉल्यूशन हो रही है इसने समस्याओं के हल की संभावनाएं तो बढ़ाई हैं लेकिन हमें इस बात के प्रति भी सजग किया है कि वाकई में और ज्यादा जटिल हम जितना सोचते थे कि ह्यूमन बायोलॉजी कितनी जटिल है उससे कहीं ज्यादा जटिल है जब से हमने जेनेटिक्स का क ख ग घ समझना शुरू किया है ये ये अध्याय तो और भी अधिक कठिन होता चला जा रहा है डॉक्टर सुब्रमण्यम ने अटेक्सिया की परिभाषा बताई उन्होंने ये बताया कि सेरेबेलम के अलावा नर्वस सिस्टम के कुछ अन्य पार्ट होते हैं प्रोप्रियोसेप्शन वाले उनसे भी अटेक्सिया होता है उन्होंने बताया कि अटेक्सिया का हम डॉक्टर लोग डायग्नोसिस कैसे करते हैं निदान कैसे बनाते हैं सबसे पहले हम हिस्ट्री सुनते हैं इतिवृत्त 
उसके बाद हम फिजिकल एग्जामिनेशन करते हैं शारीरिक जांच उसके बाद हम एम वगैरह कराते हैं इमेजिंग और उसके बाद हम बायोकेमिकल टेस्ट या डीएनए टेस्ट कराते हैं हमारे कई मरीज पूछते हैं कि जब इलाज ही नहीं है तो डीएनए टेस्ट कराने से क्या फायदा उन मरीजों को मैं ये कहता हूँ और डॉक्टर सुब्रमण्यम ने भी यही कहा कि यदि आपके पास डीएनए टेस्ट होगा तो भविष्य में अगर कोई इलाज निकलता है तो वो आपके लिए फायदेमंद है कि नहीं ये आपको जल्दी मालूम पड़ जाएगा और दूसरा आपकी जेनेटिक काउंसलिंग बेहतर तरीके से हो पाएगी कि आप प्रेडिक्टिव टेस्टिंग अपने बच्चों में अपने अन्य परिवार के सदस्यों में करा पाएंगे और उसका मोड ऑफ इनहेरिटेंस अर्थात आनुवंशिकता नई पीढ़ियों में कैसे आ रही है ऑटोसोमल रिसेसिव ऑटोसोमल डोमिनेंट है ये सब पता लगाने के लिए डीएनए टेस्ट सब लोगों को कराना चाहिए और ये एक काम है जो अटेक्सिया अवेयरनेस सोसाइटी के लिए एडवोकेसी का लक्ष्य है ये हमारी जितनी भी सोसाइटी होती है इनका एक काम होता है एडवोकेसी पैरवी करना पैरवी कहाँ करना गवर्नमेंट से करना क्या बात की पैरवी करना कि पब्लिक सेक्टर में डीएनए टेस्ट जो इतने महंगे होते हैं प्राइवेट में वो पब्लिक सेक्टर में हमको फ्री में मिलना चाहिए ये एक एडवोकेसी का हमारा एक लक्ष्य है डॉक्टर सुब्रमण्यम ने यह भी बताया कि अटेक्सिया किसी एक सिंगल बीमारी का नाम नहीं है ये तो एक लक्षण है एक सिम्टम है और इसकी जो जेनेटिक्स है वो इतनी हेटेरोजीनियस है इतनी विविध है इतनी विविध है कि सैकड़ों जीन्स उसके पीछे जिम्मेदार हैं ऐसा नहीं कि एक जीन एक बीमारी एक बीमारी एक जीन बल्कि ये इतना जटिल है कि एक जीन से एक से अधिक बीमारियां हो सकती है और किसी एक बीमारी को पैदा करने के लिए एक से अधिक जीन की भूमिका हो जाती है फिर आपने बताया कि जो जेनेटिक खराबी होती है उनको ट्राई न्यूक्लियोटाइड रिपीट कहते हैं ये खास तरह का म्यूटेशन होता है और इसमें ट्राई न्यूक्लियोटाइड का मतलब होता है तीन न्यूक्लियोटाइड डीएनए जो होता है वो तीन न्यूक्लियोटाइड की भाषा में जिसको हम कोड लैंग्वेज या कूत भाषा बोलते हैं उस कोड लैंग्वेज में डीएनए बात करता है कि प्रोटीन की रचना कौन कौन से अमीनो एसिड से मिलकर बनेगी वो जो सारा संदेश है डीएनए आर को देगा मैसेजर आर एन फिर राइबोसोमल आर तक जाएगा और वहां पर जो साइटोप्लाजम में तरह तरह के अमीनो एसिड तैर रहे हैं उनको किस क्रम में जमाना है सारा जो कूट लैंग्वेज है वो भरी रहती है और उस उस कोड वर्ड में गड़बड़ी आ जाती है जब ट्राई न्यूक्लियोटाइड रिपीट आ जाते हैं तो उसकी तुलना में करूंगा जैसे आप पुराने जमाने में रिकॉर्ड प्लेयर होता था ना और उस पर चलाते चलाते सुई अटक जाती थी तो वो एक ही लाइन गाने की बार बार रिपीट होती थी तो ट्राई न्यूक्लियोटाइड कुछ इस तरह के होते हैं कि गाने की सुई अटक जाती है और आप मैसेज आप तक जाने नहीं पाता है डॉक्टर सुब्रमण्यम ने हमको ये भी बताया कि जो म्यूटेशन होते हैं ये दो तरह की खराबी करते हैं या तो लॉस ऑफ फंक्शन या गेन ऑफ फंक्शन तो उस जीन के द्वारा जो प्रोटीन बनना था उस प्रोटीन के द्वारा जो काम होना था अब चूंकि वो प्रोटीन नहीं बन रहा है इसलिए फंक्शन खत्म हो गया उसको बोलते हैं लॉस ऑफ फंक्शन फिर उन्होंने बताया गेन ऑफ फंक्शन इन म्यूटेशन ऐसा आया कि उसमें वो जो प्रोटीन बन रहा था बन रहा था उसका एक विकृत रूप उस प्रोटीन का ज्यादा मात्रा में बनने लग गया तो वह गेन ऑफ फंक्शन हो गया और फिर अल्टीमेटली इन्होंने माइटोकॉन्ड्रिया के रोल के बारे में बताया ये माइटोकॉन्ड्रिया छोटी छोटी रचनाएं होती हैं जो हमारी कोशिकाओं में रहती हैं और ऊर्जा पैदा करने का काम करती हैं और उसमें म्यूटेशन आ जाते हैं तो हमारे कोशिकाओं में लोह तत्व आयरन का ओवरलोड हो जाता है उसके कारण ऑक्सीडेटिव स्ट्रेस होता है और फिर उन्होंने बहुत ही संक्षेप में बड़े पासिंग तरीके से क्रिस्पर का उल्लेख किया लेकिन उस हम उम्मीद कर रहे थे शायद वो क्रिस्पर के बारे में ज्यादा बताएंगे लेकिन ऐसा लगता है कि अभी हमें और प्रतीक्षा करना पड़ेगी क्रिस्पर टेक्निक हमारे लिए काम की होगी कि नहीं उन्होंने एक पॉजिटिव रिजल्ट बताया ओमा वैक्सलोन और अब हम इस स्टेज पर पहुंच गए कि शायद अब एफ डी अप्रूवल की रास्ता देख रहे हैं डॉक्टर साहब ने पाइप लाइन में क्या क्या है तो पाइप लाइन होती है ना पानी आने वाला रहता है तो अब आगे क्या आएगा आगे क्या आएगा तो उन्होंने अनेक रिसर्च के बारे में उल्लेख किया सेल पेनिट्रेटिंग पेप्टाइड्स के बारे में बताया जीन को चालू कैसे करना बंद कैसे करना नॉकडाउन कैसे करना जीन को कोशिकाओं में प्रवेश कैसे करवाना प्रवेश करवाने के लिए आपको वेक्टर लगते हैं जीन को आप डायरेक्टली कोशिका में प्रवेश नहीं करवा सकते तो उस वेक्टर के लिए आपको एडिनो वायरस लेना पड़ती है कई प्रकार के डिजाइनर मालिक्यूल बताना पड़ते हैं तो ये सब मिलकर हमको समझ में आता है कि अत्यंत जटिल रसायन है बहुत कॉम्प्लिकेटेड केमिस्ट्री है और हमें इस बात का दुख है कि अनेक बीमारियों में भले इलाज नहीं निकला हो जैसे कहते हैं ना डीएमआरडी डिसीज मॉडिफाइंग एजेंट वो तो नहीं है एल्जामर में भी नहीं है पार्किसन में भी नहीं है लेकिन कम से कम पार्किसन में सिम्टोमेटिक ट्रीटमेंट तो है लेकिन दुर्भाग्य की बात है कि अटेक्सिया में सिम्टोमेटिक ट्रीटमेंट भी नहीं है ठीक है बीमारी रहे अंदर लेकिन जब तक है तब तक हम उसके लक्षणों को तो कम कर दें हम उम्मीद करते हैं कि सिम्टोमेटिक ट्रीटमेंट भी जल्दी निकलेगा एक और चीज में जानना चाहूंगा 
कि जब ये मैसेंजर आर एन ए वैक्सीन निकला कोविड के लिए मॉडर्ना का और फाइजर का उसे एक बहुत ही महत्वपूर्ण विकास माना गया है वैक्सीन टेक्नोलॉजी में और उसी के संदर्भ में ये पढ़ने में आ रहा था कि अब इस विधि से न्यूरो डिजेनरेटिव बीमारियों के इलाज में भी ये जो जिस टेक्नोलॉजी के आधार पर हमारे देश में तो नहीं आया है मैसेजर आर एन ए वैक्सीन हमारे यहाँ तो पारंपरिक तरीके से जो कोविशील्ड और कोवैक्सीन है वो बने हैं लेकिन अमेरिका में और यूरोप के कई देशों में मैसेजर आर एन ए वैक्सीन चल रहा है जो थोड़ा हमारे लिए महंगा है लेकिन उसकी जो टेक्निक है वो बड़ा ब्रेक थ्रू माना जा रहा है और ऐसी उम्मीद करते हैं कि और सर ने उसमें और उल्लेख भी किया था अपने टॉप के अंदर सुरमनी साहब ने कि आर एन ए लेवल पर हम कैसे एक्ट करेंगे और अगर आपने एस सी के बारे में बताया एस सी भारत में बहुत ज्यादा पाया जाता है या तो फॉर्मल डोमिनेंट अटेक्सिया है और ये खास तौर से अग्रवाल कम्युनिटी में ज्यादा पाया जाता है और इसमें ट्रेमर प्रमुख लक्षण होता है अटेक्सिया कम होता है लेकिन ट्रेमर ज्यादा होती है और हमें डॉक्टर साहब की बातें सुनकर थोड़ा गर्व भी हुआ जब उन्होंने कहा कि वो पचास साल पहले भारत छोड़ के गए थे और अब वो आते हैं और पढ़ते हैं तो उन्हें लगता अच्छा भारत में ये भी होता अच्छा भारत में ये भी होता है एक और चीज पर हमें गर्व होता है कि क्योंकि हमारी आबादी ज्यादा है और क्योंकि हमारे यहाँ अच्छे रिसर्चर भी आ गए हैं तो हम ज्यादा अच्छे से क्लिनिकल रिसर्च कर पाएंगे हमारे पास क्योंकि जब भी रिसर्च होती है तो वहां सांख्यिकी गणना स्टेटिस्टिकल कैलकुलेशन में सिग्निफिकेंस देखना पड़ता है और उसके लिए नंबर चाहिए रहते हैं हाउ मेनी नंबर ऑफ पेशेंट्स यू कैन रिक्रूट इन ए स्टडी वो उसमें हम हिंदुस्तानी लोग आगे हैं आगे हो सकते हैं तो अंत में मैं यही कहूंगा कि ये जो रिसर्च है ये बड़ी धीमी है बड़ी श्रम साध्य है आ, बहुत मेहनत मांगती है बहुत समय मांगती है बहुत पैसा मांगती है लेकिन भारत इस दिशा में आगे बढ़ रहा है हमारे यहाँ अच्छी रिसर्च हो सकती है हम चाहेंगे कि अंतर्राष्ट्रीय स्तर का कोलोबरेशन जैसा कि आपने कहा कि यूरोपियन लोगों ने ग्लोबल अटैक से इनिशिएटिव लिया है हम उसमें जुड़ना चाहेंगे रिलोटॉर नाम का मालिक्यूल का आपने उल्लेख नहीं किया रिलोटॉर मालिक्यूल अवेलेबल है पिछले तीस साल से मोटर निरान डिसीज के लिए एम आई ट्रॉफिक के लिए और वो कोई चमत्कार तो नहीं है लेकिन बीमारी के बिगड़ने की दर पर थोड़ा सा मध्यम सा ब्रेक लगाता है गाड़ी तो फिर भी जाएगी ढलान पे अंततः गिरेगी लेकिन उसको ढलान पे आपने थोड़ा सा ब्रेक लगा दिया आपके गिरने की दर कम हो जाती है और अभी पिछले पांच सालों में कुछ एविडेंस आया है कि अटेक्सिया में भी कुछ प्रकार के अटेक्सिया में रेलोटार काम करता और रेलोटार भारत में उपलब्ध है लेकिन मार्केट में उपलब्ध नहीं है केवल एक फार्मा कंपनी है जो उसको फ्री सैंपल के रूप में उपलब्ध कराती है लेकिन पर्याप्त मात्रा में उपलब्ध नहीं है लेकिन पिछले कुछ सालों से मैंने अटेक्सिया के पेशेंट को भी रेलोटार प्रिस्क्राइब करना शुरू कर दिया है तो ये मेरा आ, कुछ पांच सात मिनट का संक्षिप्त सारांश हुआ डॉक्टर साहब ने जो बोला आ, बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद थैंक यू सो मच डॉक्टर पौराणिक आपने बहुत ही कम समय में काफी कुछ समझा दिया काफी लोगों को Uh, सारांश दे दिया एक तरह से समराइज किया अब uh, मैं uh, चाहती हूँ कि इफ एनी वन इन द ऑडियंस हैव एनी क्वेश्चंस आई वुड लाइक टू ओपन द स्टेज टू द ऑडियंस एंड दे कैन अनम्यूट देम फर्स्ट दे हैव टू रेज देयर हैंड्स एंड आई वुड रियली वेलकम क्वेश्चंस फ्रॉम द मेडिकल कम्युनिटी फ्रॉम द हेल्थ केयर प्रोवाइडर्स uh and uh, please raise your hands and we will unmute you, unmute you uh, and you can ask your question and introduce yourself as well uh, so yeah there is one question first of all i want to ask you madam can you hear me properly yes we can yes, hear yes, you we can क्षिया बोथ okay we uh, i think the question is very fa fairly simple uh, he's asking if there is a relation between uh, ibs and uh, which is i think uh, irritable yeah, is the yeah. problem madam yeah i don't think i don't i don't i don't think there's any relationship ibs is a very common problem in many patients uh, many people in general so we don't see that uh, 
we had this large Friedreich's ataxia study where we thought that so-called inflammatory bowel disease is more common in Friedreich's patients, you know, ileitis, Crohn's disease sort of thing, but that's very soft data. My advice is, of course, you know, make sure it is not something serious in the, in the stomach. Um, if not, you know, most IBS patients require symptomatic, you know, diarrhea medicine or something like that. And uh, uh, fiber and uh, exercise and fluids and the usual thing. So it's, uh, I don't see a relationship between ATAX and IBS. Thank you, doctor. Uh, there is one more question. I think, yeah. Bhavag. Yeah. Yes. And then so Ram again. Se, Ram se, Ram se. So the, there was a question in the chat box about SCA2. I mean, the the progression rates of this is. Um, the earlier you get it onset, the probably a little bit quicker. We use a scale called SARA, S-A-R-A, which is just a neurological exam that we kind of train ourselves to do. And uh, it has been used in about, I mean, strictly used in the, in the natural history study in US and in uh, Europe, one and two, well, uh, SCA1 seems to have the more rapid progression. Most of these disorders, the score increases by one to two per year. Uh, in this system, the scoring system, um, zero is being normal and 40 is somebody who's got a severe problem. So it goes up by about one to two per year. One seems to have a little bit closer to two, like 1.8 or 1.9 per year. And the others are like 1.3 to 1.4 points per year. Now, it's you know these scoring sheets are uh, scoring ray, uh, scales are not very precise, and but that's the best we have at this point in time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on behalf of Sudhava, uh, uh, he is going to uh, he's my uh, grandfather, mm -hmm. and uh, he's going to ask the question. So, please go ahead. Well, doctor, good morning. Good morning. Uh, you, I want to ask you a question. You know, all of us know the tossing of coins. Suppose two persons are tossing a coin. Then you know outcomes are H, 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 T, 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 H. These are the four outcomes. And each with the coin is fair, each outcome has equal probability. Similarly, producing an offspring, we can consider that husband and wife are tossing fretics in gene. And outcomes are dominant, recessive, recessive, dominant, recessive, 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 recessive dominant and dominant dominant. These are the four outcomes and they have equal probability. Now you know that a coin can be prepared in which one particular outcome has more probability. So similarly, can we think of that uh, we, we can also prepare and out uh, prepare the protection genes such that they have one particular um, outcome. But they have the probability of one out particular outcome is very large, uh, uh, very less. For example, RR this probability should be least. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure that that's possible. Um, um, I mean, there we do see in some genetic disorders that um, the 
possibility of transmitting a disease is more with one gender than the other, something called meiotic segregation. It's possible that that can exist in some of the repeat expansion disorders that it may be possible. We, I mean, certainly the transmission of a larger repeat in SCA2 and SCA3 uh, is more, more if the father is affected than the mother. But in terms of the probability of acquiring it. Now, you should remember that free drugs, you need bad copy from father as well as mother. And the probability is probably about the same, whether you'll get a bad copy or a good copy. Um, but it's possible that it's a bit different between mothers and fathers. I, I, it's possible. Uh, uh, we don't have enough data to look at it. No, no, I mean, uh, can we have but, some but, medical... But, uh, no, uh, no, I don't way. think there is a way... I wish to, this can be done. I don't think there is a way to medically influence it. It's an interesting and idea. It, yeah, it is an interesting idea, but I don't know the answer. <laughs> I don't think so. I cannot think of an answer right off the bat. Um, so what with the, with the repeats, we often think, for example, that if the repeats get very large, uh, it, the, the spermatozoa may not survive. So that's why sometimes you see a maternal, uh, you know, the chance for mothers transmitting may be higher in some diseases, not in every. And, and I don't think there is any, any data in the SCAs to say that that is the case because I don't, but in terms of influencing it medically, I have no way. Thank you so much, uh, yeah. Doctor. Um, he's also he he's a retired mathematics professor. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I we think you could make it like out. <laughs> we we need people like him because it's all yes. computational now. <laughs> uh, he has also written a publication on um, Tedris Ataxia research. He has done some research on that. Does he have Friedreichs? Is that what he has? Uh, he doesn't have it. His daughter Swasti okay. is his daughter oh, yeah. actually. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay. And I am his, her niece, so that's okay. the whole family. Yeah. The moving force. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, also, I would like to tell the audience that uh, right now, Dr. Subramani is uh, in Florida. That's why he addressed good morning to him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, we, can, we, will, we are having a more hands raised. Uh, I think Soul Gaming, that's the name I will... Let her speak first. Uh, can you unmute yourself? Uh... Hello, good evening. Yeah, good evening. I am from yeah, I am from Bhopal, MB. Uh, actually, I want to ask about uh, the uh, is any um, hello, sir. Good evening, sir. Hi. Yeah, yeah, you I can hear you. Uh, sir, sir. Uh, I want to whether any scale to assess ataxia in newborn. Or but with the sign and symptoms we have to go through. Repeat the question. Uh, may I know about uh, the scale to assess ataxia in a newborn? As you said, <laughs> there I, is I an ataxia in newborn. Is there any scale, or we have to see about, uh, about? Yeah, how no, to we don't. Scale? We don't have a scale. Then how to know are... that the child is ha uh, having a toxic mo uh, things or in newborn, how to assess it? Oh, I don't think there is a way to tell in a newborn, okay? I mean, I don't see how you can. Uh, in fact, the cerebellum probably develops, it's one part of the brain that continues to develop after birth. So actually, if you look at children, one to two years of age, as they walk, as they learn, they learn to walk, their walking looks like a taxic walking, probably because their cerebellum is not mature. So literally, uh, sometimes, of course, we do see, you know, newborns and very early infants being diagnosed, because they have other things, a lot of, there are some uh, ataxias and mutations that will affect the cerebellum that will affect the babies when they're very small. They usually have other things on top of that. They have, you know, um, like other brain problems, uh, et cetera. And a lot of them sometimes get a diagnosis of cerebellar ataxia because they scan the baby and they find that the cerebellum is small. So that can happen. You get a diagnosis of cerebellar 
disease, but the ataxia, which is the movement problem, you cannot really assess it. And most of the scales we use, we cannot use them under the age of about eight to 10. Because in children, you have, even if you have a disorder like ataxia telangiectasia, you have a problem where the disease is getting worse, but the children are maturing. The motor skills get better in even normally. So there is a competing development of the nervous system. So these scales do not work very well in children. Thank you, sir. Thank you, doctor. Um, is that, the, does that answer your question, uh, Miss? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ashia Nurula. Uh, yeah, you can go ahead. Uh, my question, sir, my question is, uh, as in stroke, we have uh, like we have a recovery time of three to four months, in which we we can see patients recovering faster than if we uh, do the treatment later on. Just like that, in even in ataxia, do we have the recovery time, sir? Time span that uh, soon after di diagnosis, if we do any treatment or we, if we give therapy, they'll recover in some months' time. Is it like that, sir? Well, it depends on what is causing the ataxia. So, when if you have a cerebellar damage from things like stroke, or uh, sometimes I've seen ataxia after heat stroke, for example, um, or uh, in, in those things will improve over a period of uh, six months to a year. Uh, and But some of the other things we talked about today, like the genetic and other degenerative ataxias, there's transient improvement with physical therapy, but their overall course is that of slow progression downward. downward. So depends on what is causing it. If you have ataxia from uh, some medication that was given, uh, toxic to the cerebellums, like some cancer therapies, you can get better over a period of time. Yeah. And the, the children often get much better than adults when they get a cerebellar injury, like, yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, Madhav, uh, you can go ahead. Uh, Just a minute, Madhav. I don't think we are, you are audible right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yes, Madhav, you can go ahead. Hello. I am Vivek now. I wanted to ask, uh, is resting or sleeping pills is dangerous for ataxia? Which? What is resting? Rest resting or sleeping pills are, uh, can oh. aggravate ataxia? No, but I think many, some of the sleeping pills may make your balance a little bit worse you know, some of the Valium or like drugs probably can. Mm -hmm. Generally, it's not a major problem if you use it in, um, you know, the appropriate dose. Okay. I'm using Restil 2.5, very low dose. Is it okay? Dr. Puranik probably can answer. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay, okay. Rest, rest is Alprazolam and 0.25 milligram is okay. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you. I think that without a doubt, many, many ataxians had. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I did put my email address on the chat uh, area. Uh, so please uh, don't hesitate to get get me on email. Um, question about sleep disorders. You know, we do see sleep disorders in ataxias, particularly obstructive sleep apnea. And uh, those can be made better with uh, devices. 
Uh, thank you, doctor. Mm -hmm. I, a question I, about uh, etavirine, I think. Yeah, that's an old, that's an HIV drug that, you know, laboratory has um, caused the frataxin to go up. Um, I have not, I, I, there may be a trial being planned, but my research suggests that that drug does not get into the brain very well, even in people being treated for HIV. So um, I'm not, I, I'm not asking, I mean, I'm not letting people go on it. Some of my patients wanted to go on that drug called etavirine. Yasmin, you can go ahead. You can also introduce yourself. Uh, I'm a late onset FA patient. Oh, and no. uh, I would like to ask, yes, uh, uh, I would like to ask whether, uh, you know, the omovilazolone is of uh, um, particular use in FA patient? Yeah, so that's where we did the trial. And the reason this drug was used in FA is uh, this particular drug activates a molecule called NRF2. And there was evidence based on laboratory study that in Friedreich's uh, patients and cells and animal models, this NRF2 is not as active as it should be. It's a pathway in the cell that protects you against oxidative stress. It's a protection, it's a defense mechanism. So when we did trials with drugs like CoQ10 and Idibinon, which reduces oxidative stress, like, uh, you know, mops up the oxygen, they did not do very well, but this drug increases the molecules that uh, are deficient in free drugs and that are defense against oxidative stress. So it increases things like glutathione and things like that. So it seems so to be have a better result. So please, first and second clinical trials are, uh, are done. And uh, this particular mark, the trial for RTA408 Omavalon is finished. It, uh, we still have the patients in open label. Okay. Uh, I would say that, you know, in none of this do we expect the patients to swing around and start running uh, or, you know, having that kind of impact. But this drug seems to have reduced progression, like, you know, to a degree. So, and I think you know like the Riata pharmaceuticals also, that the Riata pharmaceuticals is. Um, yeah, they are the ones who. Right, and and yeah. in general, they are working with the FDA to see if it will be approved in the US. Okay. I mean, I, like I said, I, that's why I find, I, I think there's some data suggesting that curcumin is also an NRF2 activator. So in the absence of this drug, you know, one of the problems we face, as you know, when, when these drugs are approved, they become very costly. Um, okay. And then, uh, of course, uh, India has the reputation of being the generic capital of the world. So at some point in time, it'll, the technology gets transferred and better you know whatever it is i don't know the the politics and the the mechanics of this um that's but so uh, sir you see is as a hope for the fa patients sorry sir sorry ma'am uh is there is a hope for fa patient i think so yeah i think i think some of these things are going to become is tre treatable in some way or the other yes there is definitely hope. We are us. <laughs> uh, I think we are done with the questions. I think we can conclude now. It's more than two hours now. <laughs> yeah, we are almost done with the questions. That are, um, now, which, okay. So, and last, finally, um, we are at the end of the today's webinar. 
Thank you so, so much, uh, Dr. Subramani. Uh, you've not only just uh, given the talk, you've also addressed many, many questions. And I've sent, I sent him all your queries, all the audience's queries, which we received. And he has covered every, everything. And I'm very grateful to him. Uh, according to ASIS tradition, uh, Ms. Jagrati will give the thank you speech. And uh, that's it. Over to you, Jagrati. Thank you, anytime. Good evening, everyone. I am Jagrati Upasni from us. It is a such an honor for me to get the opportunity to thank all dignitaries on behalf of Ataxia Awareness Society. Firstly, I would like to thank our special guest, Dr. Subramani, for taking out time from his busy schedule and from enlightening us with his knowledge. I also thank you for Dr. Apurva Purani to help us better understand and analyze today's talk. I extend my gratitude to our president, Ms. Swasti Vag, to organize this webinar and also appreciate the hard work of organizing team to make this webinar successful. I also thank all participants for their active participation. Thank you everyone once again for making it great success. Thank you very much. I think we should also thank uh, Dr. Ramayya Mathayla. Uh, he has been the bridge and uh, inspiration. Yes. Uh, I'm so glad to note that uh, about 150 or more than 150 participants were there at most, for most of the time. It's yes. only now that they have started giving towards the end. Yes. And uh, we are so yes. sorry. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Excellent conference. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. So we take leave. Yeah, I'm ending the meeting. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. We are leaving. Thank you. Have a nice.